um, CAO um, group together. Uh, we are meeting virtually and um, I would like to welcome all of you as we get going for another plan year. Um, uh, Glenn has sent out all of the information, uh, um, including an agenda. If you look at the agenda for today, what we're doing is something that we've followed now uh, for the last two years, um, over two years, uh, looking at the impact of COVID uh, on our prevention and uh, uh, prevention services, uh, telehealth utilization, and impact on, um, on dental services. So that's going to be the bulk of our meeting today. Um, we do then go into, uh, after our break, we go into um, uh, reviewing the CIAO charter, who's on it, and then we're going to talk some about the joint oeb -PEB, uh, pilot projects. Uh, and the reason that we can start talking about those joint projects is that, as you all know, we've transitioned to the um, uh, to the new um, uh, consultants to Mercer. And um, I know that um, I think the board has had an introduction, but uh, our consultants are very important uh, to how we, uh, as a group, work group get our work done. So I would like um, just to, I, Kirsten, I see that you're on the um, line. Uh, I know that uh, if you look at the agenda, uh, we're not getting presentations from our consultants today. But if you could just again introduce the team, um, that would be wonderful. Sure, of course. Would you like me to do that now? Sorry. Please. Yeah, that would be great. Great. Hi. Hi, everyone. So I'm Kirsten Stavlin, the lead actuary on the OEP Mercer team. We also have Maggie King Kate. She's our lead project manager and really integral to the team. You'll run into Sally Hill, who is our renewal manager. Also, Todd Francisco is our lead consultant. And you'll see um, Todd and Sally both throughout the day for CIAO and um, and the board meeting, depending on schedules and Maggie and I as well. So thanks everyone. Great, thank you very much, uh, Kirsten. Um, okay, so what we have, uh, I'm just looking at the people I see Robert on and I've seen, um, I've seen Bill on and I'm now just looking for Jeff. Uh, has Jeff joined us? Maybe he's, not. He's still on vacation, Tom. Okay, so Jeff is not going to join us. So it'll just be uh, in terms of CIAO members, it'll be the, the uh, Bill, Robert, and myself. Um, and obviously, we have uh, our uh, consultants, our the OEB uh, leadership and staff, and we have our um, carriers uh, joining us today. So welcome. Uh, the first order of business is the re is the review and approval of the meeting synopsis from June. Any questions, additions, or uh, otherwise, we all accept a motion to approve. I'll move to approve. I so, think I will second. Well, thank you, the two of you. All in favor, say aye. 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 <laughs> okay. So we get to move on now to uh, our. Uh, first agenda item, which is uh, COVID impact of medical prevent preventive services. And uh, we have both Kaiser Permanente and Moda presenting today. So I, uh, first up is Kaiser, um, Dr. Bachman, and then we have uh, Sapari Sturdivant and Twinkle Singh. So you're on, folks. Great. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, OEB staff. Good morning, Mercer team, uh, and good morning, board members. Thank you for having us here and um, reviewing our uh, preventive services uh, update. We'll be focusing on sort of four key measures um, uh, with our preventive services, looking at the pattern uh, following COVID. Then we'll be talking a little bit about how we're thinking about health equity, uh, geographic disparities, 
uh, and member engagement. So with that, we can go ahead and move on to the next uh, slide. And first we'll be talking about childhood and adolescent well care. So just to orient you to all these slides, which are gonna look pretty similar um, in format, uh, at least the data slides, you'll see the OEB rate in orange uh, and our book of business commercial rate in blue. And most of the time you'll see in all these slides, OEB tends to do a little bit better than our commercial book of business. Uh, on the bottom there would be your HEDIS uh, comparators uh, for the most recent year that we have data available um, that is percent, expressed as a percentile uh, compared to uh, other uh, HMO uh, health plans. HMO tend to run higher rates for HEDIS levels compared to um, uh, PPO plans. Um, this child and adolescent well care measure is a new measure, which is why the data just goes back uh, to 2021. Um, the number is low, uh, certainly was low in 2021. We lost 14,000 well care visits in the three or four months where clinics were primarily closed for routine ambulatory well care. As you can see, although they've come up to a certain extent, we've never really caught up and, and got back to levels that we would expect to see. Um, our numbers are still are headed towards the 75th percentile, but remain uh, below the 75th percentile. A little bit surprising that we did not see improvements between January and July of 2022. Talking to our uh, pediatric and child experts, uh, they noticed that um, they saw a different pattern of illness and, and healthcare use in over the past year with more ill children and less seasonal variation uh, related to it. Some of that undoubtedly is related to mental health. Some of that is related to just different patterns of healthcare. For our family medicine department, which is growing uh, and a significant portion of children and adolescents are seen in our family medicine department, uh, there is some displacement of visits with more urgent adult care being displacing some of the, the availability of routine child well care. So in that order, we're doing lots of tactics to mitigate this and get these numbers back up higher. Uh, those include doing more outreach, the 19 to 21 year old age group, uh, which is lagging even further behind, uh, changing our uh, scheduling grids to allow for more online scheduling of uh, routine well care. Um, and then just more outreach overall in, in various different settings. Um, so we do expect the rate to go up. This is one of our key strategic priority areas for our uh, system. Uh, and we are working hard to get those numbers back up to the high levels that we expect uh, uh, through Kaiser Permanente care delivery. Next slide. Next slide talks about breast cancer screening. And we're seeing um, improvements, almost getting back to our our pre-2020 uh, numbers there. Currently for OEB, the number is above the uh, HEDIS 90th percentile uh, with the OEB rate being 79.4% versus the HEDIS, HEDIS uh, at 79.0%. Again, you saw a significant dip in 2020 uh, when due to PPE considerations, uh, there was not um, uh, the, the use of uh, mammography uh, really decreased. It's come back up, uh, and then we're seeing really good good improvements uh, throughout uh, 2022. A little bit of a dip, and then an improvement over the last few months. So uh, that's our breast cancer screening. We're just kind of using our usual uh, multifaceted tactics, uh, out, outreaching to members and scheduling while they're in uh, in the office for another visit, uh, outreaching to people via phone, text, uh, or live call uh, if someone is due for that. Uh, we're expanding our automated uh, reminder program uh, that also goes through text and email and postcard with English and Spanish language being supported uh, and um, uh, just doing other marketing campaigns related to uh, breast cancer screening uh, and ongoing needs. Um, assumption is this will eventually get back up to uh, levels in 2020. Uh, there is still uh, staffing concerns as there is throughout healthcare um, right now, which could have some of a mitigating or, or uh, impacting factor. Uh, additionally, we're concerned about sort of the priorities of healthcare consumers. Uh, some may be less interested in prevention if they're having other struggles at the current time. Um, so all hands on deck, 
uh, lots of different modalities to improve this measure. Uh, the numbers uh, not quite to where it was in uh, 2020, uh, yet above the um, heat is 90th percentile, at least uh, for OEB. Uh, next slide, please. Going under cervical cancer, and you'll see sort of uh, a similar picture with reductions uh, in 2020. This is a five year look back when you do uh, the HPV along with the PAP, uh, PAP exam at the same time, which is why this one kind of deterred less uh, over 2020. Um, but the numbers stayed about the same since uh, that time. The HEDIS, OEB HEDIS numbers are above the 90th percentile uh, at 81.1% uh, versus 80.1% uh, uh, for the 90th percentile uh, in HMOs. Um, again, this is still this is also a high priority measure for our system uh, with lots of work going on. Uh, we are excited to uh, revitalize and reinvigorate a, a nurse PAP screening program, which is actually done in most countries, <coughs> having an RN uh, do a PAP examination uh, in the OBGYN department. So that's one of our tactics uh, that should help improve cervical cancer screening. Next slide. And then colorectal cancer screening, and we are seeing numbers that are really quite good there. Uh, not quite on par with where they were in January 2020, uh, but getting there uh, well above the HEDIS. Um, actually not, so has not yet achieved the HEDIS 75th percentile, currently for OEB 69.9%, but we're seeing year of, uh, month over month improvements um, and we do expect this number to come uh, back up to at least the 75th percentile over the next few months. Again, similar sort of outreach strategies that we're using for mammography, discussions during office visits, um, colonoscopies being uh, available outside Kaiser Permanente. It's a fairly straightforward procedure. We have some excellent um, uh, clinical colleagues that are willing to or are happy to see our patients uh, in their ambulatory surgery centers um, because it's we recognize it's not as well integrated that way, but this is a fairly straightforward procedure and we send our lower risk people to our outside uh, groups uh, to help with that. And again, half our members do get colorectal cancer screening performed via FIT tests uh, starting at age 45. Um, the FIT test is a yearly uh, stool test uh, that looks for microscopic blood in the stool, um, which is as effective as colonoscopy for advanced colon cancer uh, prevention. Uh, Keith, uh, did yeah. uh, I know that we? Uh, my understanding is is that the age of of onset of screening has dropped from fifty to forty five. Yeah, is the, that included in HEDIS yet? No, HEDIS is still fifty and up. Okay. I would anticipate over the next year that to change. We are starting our outreach uh, at age forty five. So we can anticipate once they we hit the forty five, those numbers are going to change will be yeah the problem from, they'll go drop. down yeah yeah okay absolutely right. okay thank you um mo moving on i kind of went through this already uh the next slide uh the um we do have uh we are looking at health equity and health disparities uh through Kind of our routine data systems as well as through all of our quality programs trying to hotspot the areas that need uh, the most um, uh, help uh, and the, where we see these disparities we just there's no in no world is any health disparity a good thing to see um, <clears throat> they're complicated uh, they're not consistent as you go from race ethnicity and gender and age uh, and language all this stuff is captured routinely in our customer reporting data systems that we use for much of the OEB data. And it's also captured internally, uh, and it's also used by our quality uh, leaders um, as we prioritize uh, resources. Next slide. Um, just to look at the demographics uh, for OEB, this is through our uh, national customer analytics system. Um, and you can see that the group there is that first row. Our regional average is the second row. Our regional average is all of our about 340,000 commercial members uh, from Longview down to Eugene. Uh, the group is uh, OEB, and you can see that compared to our, there is some interesting variation compared to our regional average. OEB is a higher percent of 
women. Um, pretty similar uh, breakdown in terms of age. Uh, a, a significantly higher percent of Latino individuals at 15.9%, or 50.8%. Um, uh, most are English speaking at 96.3%. Uh, and only 12% have been with, with KP less than a year. Um, race, ethnicity is a, story, is a story. We have about 85% of our um, population with self-reported and captured electronic record uh, race ethnicity. We are implementing the Real D uh, program as people particularly uh, request services, particularly COVID-related services. It's a much smaller percent of the population uh, that has Real D data uh, attached to it as well. We do within our system, we do have finer gradations of ethnicity uh, reported, uh, but this is kind of the major buckets of ethnicity and race uh, here. You can see below there uh, on self-reported language uh, as a primary language, 2.6% uh, Spanish, 0.2% Arabic, and 0.2% Russian, uh, and that's for the OWEB population. Um, next slide, please. And then I don't, we're not going to go through this in detail, but this just shows as we start to look at health disparities, um, particularly kind of highlighted here, uh, the best performing uh, for each of these categories of uh, preventive services, flu immunization, breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, colorectal cancer screening. And you can see that really those are all over the map in terms of which ethnicity is the best performing uh, and which ethnicities uh, perform worse uh, or have, have those gaps uh, present. Um, and you can see in some places there are significant uh, disparities present. For some of these, uh, there's pretty minimal, like cervical cancer screening, uh, that's fairly minimal. Other tends to be a fairly uh, heterogeneous group of mostly younger individuals um, who are less um, connected with the healthcare system, less likely to have had uh, visits. Those numbers are fairly low and aren't reflective. Of what's going on. So this is something we can look at just to let you know we are thinking about health disparities uh, and our important work in the future to uh, minimize uh, those disparities. And we'll talk in subsequent slides. We'll talk about some of those tactics. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Looking at the kind of this, the way we we kind of think about geographic differences by our service areas which include uh, East Metro, West Metro, uh, uh, Clark County, Longview, Kelso, uh, and then Lane County and Mid Valley. Um, and we aren't, the way we were asked to report was sort of just Metro and Willamette Valley. Um, and that's so we are looking at those ge geographic uh, disparities as well. So we're, this is all being monitored um, by the Medical Office Building of Service. That's really how we do it. Uh, and our managers are, and lead physicians are held accountable uh, for how they're doing. And we know sometimes the tactics do, do need uh, to differ um, uh, by service area based on cultural considerations, uh, as well as sometimes availability of services. Um, next slide. Here you can see the differences by geographic, by geographic area. And this is a little bit different metric. This actually looks at care disparities, what is the rate of good blood sugar control in between Latinos and white for that upper left? What is the rate of poor difference in the delta in the rate of poor diabetes control between different re regions on the right? Um, and you can see that like in, for example, in mid valley, uh, individuals who are African American do better uh, than those who are white, but that's not consistent uh, overall. And then colorectal cancer screening on the left there. Uh, we're particularly interested in Latino versus uh, white disparities, which in colorectal cancer screening, which has been problematic. And then uh, blood pressure control there uh, on the right uh, between Latinos and white. So this is just, we have more of these, but this is some of the data that we're following closely and how we're looking at trying to reduce care disparities where present. Um, next slide, please. So um, 
Yeah, I've really talked about most of this already. Uh, we're, we do in reach when somebody is in the office, uh, even in a dental office. Uh, if they have care gaps, we do our best to mitigate those at those times and ask someone to get a lab, schedule for mammography, do a vaccination. Um, we're doing outreach and we're being more sophisticated and really revising those outreach strategies uh, post COVID as need has been changing uh, and we need a refresh of that. Uh, and then we also use the digital as much as we can as well. Um, and when somebody is what new, it's a little bit subtle, but what's new is when somebody is having an office visit uh, that's been scheduled, we will then send tailored reminders to what they're doing, saying, hey, they're going to be in the office. They think about their health. Uh, they have other questionnaires to do to prep for that visit. Um, let's get the uh, preventive um, uh, issues scheduled or completed at the same time. With that, next slide. I think we're done. Um, yeah, this is just a list of, of what, what we've already talked about here. Um, um, in terms of all the different tactics. Uh, there's pages and pages and pages of tactics for each of these. Yeah, I wish I could summarize it in a simple uh, market-friendly way, but I really can't. There's really just lots going on. Each of these things with various experts, uh, thought partners, um, uh, and strategists, both working nationally uh, through our broader quality program uh, and then regionally understanding the local nuance appropriate for community and for the culture uh, in our region. Um, it, the other um, something for uh, I'd like you to think about, and I, I'll have Mo to think about it uh, after we hear their presentation, Keith, is whether or not you think OEB should continue to do these impact of COVID updates versus, well, we've now hit a, our, our new steady state and um, have our have our discussion around prevention when we do our annual checkup. You don't have to answer that now. I want to give you a little bit of time and I'll give uh, Yale time to think about that also. Great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Keith. Um, you are welcome. Any, quest any questions from the um, any questions from the uh, CIO members? Last few slides are talked about some uh, specific tactics related to uh, health equity and uh, reducing disparities. You can look at those. Okay, um, we're now moving on to uh, Moda, and I think we have, I know Yale is part of this, and also Nathan Treadholm. Uh, I think it's just going to be me. Uh, okay. I get my camera to go here. For some reason, my camera's not turning on. There you are, Yale. Oh, it is. Okay. I'm not seeing myself. Okay. Thank you. I can see well, you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, nice to see you all. Good morning. Um, I will be presenting all of this information today from Moda regarding preventive visits, screenings, and immunization utilization for the past three years, year to date as of August 2022. Um, next slide, please. The methods we used to um, to come up with this data, we calcula calculated utilization data per month for OEB members following HEDIS numerator criteria and age appropriate populations. Uh, claims data with dates of service between January 1 of 2019 prior to um, uh, prior to COVID, obviously, and then May 30th, 2022, uh, with data as of July 31st. Uh, we normalized utilization to per 1,000 members per month and did not apply any HEDIS measure criteria, such as continuous enrollment requirements and measure exclusions. So next slide, please. Next slide. There we go. Thank you. So COVID activity by day, there have been roughly 150,000 new cases and about 5,000 hospitalizations since May of 2022, the last time we presented to you on this information. COVID activity remains high with between 1,500 and 2,000 cases a day since late April. We're not seeing as much spike in trough activity now, more just sustained activity. 
And also with more prevalent in-home testing, we're likely underreporting a significant number of cases. The bottom line is COVID activity is high and is still influencing people's decisions on how to access healthcare. So with that, the next slide, as we get into a few of the specific screening results, I just wanted to point out that we're still parsing through much of the data that was provided to us by Mercer with our own data. Um, areas where we're working with the data and is causing some pause, which, which will show up in some of the next few slides, would indicate that preventive visits and screenings are higher in areas like northeastern parts of the state, eastern parts of the state, and lower in the metropolitan area. Um, we're looking at this closely and we'll continue to evaluate it. We're confident that as we look closer at this and begin to incorporate the real D data capture, captured by Moda and Care 360 dashboards, as well as from OWEB, that we'll be able to report back to you with more accurate information. But this did show up in some of our analyses that the metro area is not um, at the highest, which is what we would sort of have been reporting and would have anticipated. So starting with breast cancer screening, and, and it's somewhat consistent through some of the other screening modalities I'm going to talk about, is there have been four dis distinct phases of activity. The pre-COVID activity, initial COVID shutdown starting in March of 2020, rebound back to pre-COVID levels between May and December of 2020, and then ongoing fluctuations since that time. Um, significantly more COVID cases uh, in 2022 compared to the prior years. However, for the spring period, we saw relatively strong mammogram utilization, which we were really happy to see. Mammogram utilization is highly seasonal, seasonal and with the increased COVID activity in June and July, this um, likely impacted those months. Um, this graph also somewhat masks the impact of COVID on an annual basis. 2021 and 22 are still significantly lower than 2019 due to the lower utilization we typically see in summer months. So next slide shows uh, breast cancer screening by race and ethnicity. Um, for ethnicity, OEB is roughly 83% non-Hispanic, 12% unknown, and 4% Hispanic. Performance among non-Hispanic members is highest, followed by unknown, followed by Hispanic. Rates fall slightly more for the unknown category and relatively are proportional across all other ethnicities for 2021 and 22. With the large percent of unknown, it's difficult to conclusively say there is a health disparity. However, the data is suggestive that Hisp Hispanics are not getting screened as frequently as non-Hispanics, which is consistent with national findings. For race, OEB is roughly 86% white, 8% unknown, and 5% all other races combined. Performance among whites is highest, followed by unknown, followed by all the other combined races. Rates fall slightly more for the unknown category, and are relatively proportional across all other races for 2021 and 2022. Again, with the large percent of unknown, it's, to, it's difficult to conclusively say there is a health disparity. However, the data is suggestive that other races and unknown race members are not getting screened as frequently as whites, which also is consistent with national findings as well. Um, next slide, please. And this, this is the breast cancer screening by region where you can see that the Northeast, Central, Bend region, and even um, the Willamette Valley show higher higher rates than Metro, which um, we, we, we are going to figure this out by um, looking at the zip code data more carefully and seeing if this act is actually um, valid true data. We, 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 we feel like there's something not quite right there, but we will we will get to the bottom of this. Um, next slide. And so colore colorectal screening, um, similar comments um, and similar to breast cancer screening, strong seasonality for utilization for summer months, but um, very high COVID activity could be suppressing utilization. But overall, we are seeing that um, screening is up for 2022 compared to 2021, which is um, uh, what we were hoping to see. Uh, next slide is very similar again to breast cancer screening by ethnicity. 
uh, non-Hispanic is highest, followed by um, a sort of a tie on this one between unknown and Hispanic, but non-Hispanic is, is a bit higher. Um, next slide. Uh, this is now going to be colorectal cancer screening by region. And again, Metro is below Northeast, below Willamette Valley. Uh, we are going to figure this out because it doesn't really parse with what, um, what we have reported in the past and um, uh, not consistent with the data that we have, that we have been more familiar, familiarly um, presenting to you. So um, next slide. This will be cervical, cran cervical cancer screenings. Um, these do not seem to be as impacted by COVID and that's possibly due to um, lower age for screenings and less concern for um, COVID uh, infection. So we're uh, pretty pleased with the numbers we see here with cervical cancer screening. Uh, next slide. Similar similar breakout between non-Hispanic, unknown, and Hispanic, as we saw with the other two. And the next slide will also show similar to um, the other two screening by region with Northeast and Willamette Valley and Central Oregon leading uh, the metro area. The next slide we'll talk about well child visits just a little bit um, in 2022 and you'll see this with the yellow bar there was a new trend for well child visits um, there's been somewhat lower utilization compared to 2021 which are the plum bars um, there's strong seasonality for this as well so this is another of area concern that we will be watching closely uh, particularly as the summer months wind down and I suspect with August now coming to an end once we look at the data through the end of this month I'm sure we will see um, a spike in those numbers what we did see in the next slide uh, in terms of his uh, disparities um, very evenly split um, unknown and non-Hispanic, very, very close with Hispanic, not really not too far behind. And um, similar to uh, race and ethnicity on the next on the, this next slide. But the the last thing I will report, and this, this slide didn't make it into the presentation, is that when we looked at well child visit utilization by region, here Metro actually did uh, come in top uh, tied with Central Bend, Central Bend area followed by um, the um, uh, western part of the state. So it's it's just interesting. Um, as I said, we will we will get to the bottom of this disparity uh, in data. Uh, but the next slide, I'll just summarize that overall looking at everything big picture um, services have rebounded from the initial drop in april of 2020 but gaps do remain most preventive services utilization trends track with COVID case activity the data is suggestive of health disparities overall but not worsening due to covid uh, increased data capture will help us in evaluating those disparities and as i said with incorporating Real D data through the Moda 360 portals, we, we should um, have much more accurate data to report over the next several months. And lastly, some preventive services were impacted more than others. Um, services for younger adults saw the lowest declines. Services for older adults saw the highest declines. And lastly, services for pediatric members are starting to decline as well. So the rest of this presentation are just appendices that uh, we could go through if you'd like, but I think um, that wraps up my portion. So Yale uh, and Keith, uh, the question that I raised uh, before was, uh, do you, does it make sense for us to continue to have these every six months um, or should we just transition to our annual prevention services? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to go first. I, I I think it's it's probably a good idea to start transitioning to just overall picture. Um, you know, I don't e even with COVID where it is right now. I and you know we can even throw monkeypox into the mix, although I don't think that's going to factor in. I, I I think now would be a good time to start transitioning into just overall prevention tactics, and um, that would be my my inclination. 
Keith? Same. Okay. Um, I have another question for you, um, for both of you. Um, you know, we are seeing, and this also goes as something that um, I think the OEB leadership needs to think about is whether or not we take examples that we're seeing in regards to health care disparities and use our communication tools that OEB has and start you know, highlighting some of them with the idea of, of letting people know that these exist and, um, and it may help normalize the getting the procedures done. So I, I, it's just a thought and I'm interested in your, uh, how, how public should we be in regards to the disparity that we're seeing. I mean, they're not outrageous. They're not, you know, flashing red lights, but I think that we may be able to use the information that we're starting to collect in a proactive way to help encourage the people who are influenced, um, who are affected by this in ways to improve their utilization. And your thoughts. I, I think I, before I would go down that path, I would want to check with people who are affected by that and to make sure that's not stigmatizing or there are not other, from their perspective, a group is not other doing reasons. as well, may, may have specific reasons as they're not, and to go down that path as opposed to just information. I think this information is out there, but I just think it's including the people who are affected by disparities in that discussion of outreach uh, as opposed to just general education, because that could be perceived as blaming. Okay. Yeah, I would yep. agree with that. I, I would agree with that 100%. I think that's a very wise, wise way to approach this. Okay. So the key then is, <coughs> excuse me, the focus then is it puts that much additional on our, on your two health plans to, uh, and your work with your clinical partners to make sure that, that we are, um, you know, a, actively and aggressively uh, dealing with it. Yeah. I think raising the issue for everybody is appropriate for the plan or for OEB. Yeah. And there's okay. no one's doing as well as they could. So. Okay. Yeah. We'll talk. We'll, we'll, move we'll talk more. That. Yeah, we'll talk yeah. more about that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, CIOM members, any comments, questions? No. Okay. Bill, you're good. All right, on to um, the telehealth uh, utilization. Uh, this is another area that we have been tracking over time um, because we saw a sea change when uh, with COVID and um, uh, it really has been a change in the way that healthcare is delivered to a large degree. Uh, so we're, we, this is one that we've been tracking. Um, we each of the plans have 15 minutes to update us on what's happening with their telehealth utilization. And we have Kaiser Permanente first again. And Keith, uh, you're joined by, um, uh, is it Adam D uh, Durkee? Correct. Can everyone Great. hear me okay? Yes, we can, Adam. Wonderful, thank you. So a lot of these slides are gonna be pretty consistent and similar to slides that we have presented in the past, but we have been able to incorporate some race ethnicity data into the slides and also switch up some of the views just to give us um, you know, a fresh take and wanted to really focus on looking at a wider time period that would enable us to see trends before and after COVID. Um, so if we can please advance to the next slide. This first slide is for OF telehealth visit utilization by modality. And here we wanted to look at January 2020 to year to date, June 2022. That's the most recent data that we have in our claims system. The um, reason we wanted to go back to 2020 again was to capture, to see, we know what the trends look like in a pre post COVID environment. And as we can see and kind of expect, we see the blue line, the face to face visits drop dramatically 
um, in March and April of 2020, right at the advent of COVID. And similarly, we'll see the green line call um, you know, jump up there. And that's really more or less because the trade-off was you know, people were favoring phone calls over face-to-face -face visits, especially at the beginning of the pandemic there. Um, as we you know, move closer to current day, we can see that they're inversely correlated and that as we see an increase in call volume, uh, the, or sorry, increase in face-to-face, -face, our call volume tends to have a, a slight decrease. Um, the one other note I'd like to make about this chart is focusing on the red line, which is our video visits. Uh, we saw a large influx of video visits uh, during the pandemic relative to before the pandemic, and it does appear that we are sustaining the popularity of the video visits here. So where the, the call, the green lines are you know, going down a little bit, we can see that that red line has remained actually fairly flat through COVID and even current day in post-COVID environment. Uh, the last note I wanted to make here was that OM is running very similar to the overall large commercial book of business, and that will more or less be a theme that we see across the slide. Next slide, please. Here we wanted to look at the overall OEB telehealth utilization by age bands. So I've broken up the population into 10-year age bands, 0 to 10, 11 to 20, so on and so forth. And as we can see here, uh, between the 11 and 40 age band, we see the highest propensity for telehealth visits. Uh, you can see, you know, the blue, the blue blocks representing the face-to-face -face are the smallest within that age band of 11 to 40. Um, another thing I would like to note here is that the green block, which it represents telephone calls, actually is fairly consistent from age band to age band, and that the ratio of telehealth visits to face-to-face -to -face is really driven by video visits, that top red line, where we can see it, you know, a steep decline in propensity for video visits with our older age bands there. Next slide, please. Here we want to look at the uh, OEB trend for primary care. Um, and this again is broken out in 2020, 2021, and then current 2022, which is going to run through January. Uh, again, as we you know, would expect in Q1 2020, before the pandemic, we had a large propensity for face-to-face -face visits. And then 2020 Q2 is when we started experiencing those COVID drivers. You know, face-to-face -face visits dropped dramatically. We start to see increased calls and video visits. And that same sort of trend carries on through 2021. Of course, in the post-pandemic world, we're seeing face-to-face -face visits come back, um, you know, taking a little bit from that call volume. Um, and again, making note of the, the video visit uh, still seems to be a, a fairly popular visit even after COVID in the wake of COVID. Next slide, please. This represents the same type of trend, but instead of primary care, we wanted to look at specialty care. Again, um, you know, between 2020 Q1 and 2020 Q2, we do see a, a dramatic decrease in overall service volume. But unlike primary care, there's a lot more stability um, starting in 2020 Q3 going forward. Uh, the hypothesis here is that, you know, much specialty care might be, you know, more of a requirement versus the primary care, which tend to be, you know, kind of evaluation management call or uh, types of visits that might not be as immediately required. So uh, the trend here, we see something very similar to, or we see what we would expect relative to primary care, a lot more stability and um, a sustained propensity for face-to-face -face visits. Can we move to the next slide, please? Here we wanted to look at the behavioral health component, and please keep in mind this is for internal visits only. Uh, this is looking at the overall behavioral health utilization by tele or by modality from January 2020 to June of 2022. Uh, the red box is meant to, you know, have folks focus on this, the fact that we really saw the highest visit volumes for mental health in between July of 2020 and June of 2021. And again, we want to look at that, that red block there, which represents our video visits, you know, in a pre-COVID environment. Um, much of our internal mental health was being delivered via face-to-face, -face, and we, you know, we pivoted strongly to telehealth video delivery during the pandemic, and even in the post-pandemic world, uh, you know, with the help of, of apps such as My Strength Calm, uh, and there was a Ginger app that Kydra also released. But um, you know, again, still seeing high propensity for video, visit, video visits for internal uh, behavioral health, even in a post-COVID world. 
Can we go to the next slide, please? And here we're looking at uh, behavioral health in an external uh, external delivery. Uh, again, we're seeing a similar trend here, uh, dominated by face-to-face -face in the first quarter of 2020, and you know during COVID and in the wake of COVID, uh, heavy adoption of video visits. Next slide, please. And this is a different cut of uh, behavioral health. This is looking at both age, band, and gender. Um, again, broken down into the zero or the 10-year age bands and looking at it from uh, male identifying versus female identifying members. As we can see here, uh, you know, see a similar propensity for, men or for uh, telehealth visits as we do in, uh, if you remember one of the first slides, showing a higher propensity for telehealth in between the 11 and 40 range. Um, you know, breaking this out by gender, we're seeing also, you know, higher likelihood that females will, will seek the mental health um, than males. You know, again, it's pretty dramatic looking at the, the male uh, gender compared to the female gender. And again, you know, seeing a lot of uh, video visit delivery here. Go to the next slide, please. And here are some new components. Um, we were able to work with some of our internal teams to add a race ethnicity component to this presentation. Uh, here, really, you know, what we want to focus on is looking at the, the race ethnicity in which our members identify and their general telehealth proportion. So, you know, focusing on the actual chart and percentages, this is mostly showing, again, you know, based on the, the race that you identify with, how you tend to utilize services. Um, what we see is, you know, generally across the board, pretty stable. Um, overall, though, you know, uh, those who identify as Asian uh, appear to have, you know, the highest propensity for the face-to-face the -face visits with um, American Indian and Alaskan Natives um, utilizing the highest percentage of telehealth visits. But really, you know, nothing too dramatic um, comes from the earth. At least we're not seeing anything too dramatic from a race ethnicity standpoint and their preference for service delivery. We'll go to the next slide, please. And this is um, using the, the county mapping based on zip code. We wanted to break out our utilization between Metro, uh, Willamette Valley, and other. And you know, as we see here, the Metro area um, utilizes just under 50% face-to-face uh, -face visits. The rest, you know, the green, the orange, and the red represent call, e-visits, and video. So you know, can be extrapolated that actually majority of members in the metro area are receiving uh, their visits via a, a telehealth modality. Compared to the Willamette Valley, you know, it's, it's only a 4% difference, but, um, you know, the majority of the Willamette Valley is actually receiving their, their uh, care via the face-to-face -face modality. And that other category is, you know, split 50-50. And so if we go to the next slide, please, we can look at this in, uh, you know, looking at it by year. Um, this is more or less the same type of, of view that we just saw, but broken out into the years, again, trying to peel out that 2020 COVID year versus what we're seeing current date. So in 2020, you know, it comes to no surprise that we're seeing depressed face-to-face -face utilization volumes due to the pandemic, um, you know, based on Metro, Willamette Valley, other, all of their face-to-face -face volumes are under 50%, meaning that they were utilizing most of the mature most of their services are being delivered via telehealth. Fast forward to 2021, we're starting to see an increase, you know, face-to-face -face coming back, which again, comes as no surprise. Um, you know, again, we're still showing Metro coming under a little bit in the Willamette Valley as far as face-to-face -face visit propensity. And then 2022 to current, we're still seeing even further growth in that face-to-face -face component from 42% looking at Metro in 2020, jumping up to 52, jumping up to 54% current day. So, Again, you know, face-to-face -face visit volume is coming back, coming back a little bit slower. Um, you know, it's being used more or less to replace the call. Um, and again, focusing on that red block up on top. The, the video visits were, they gained popularity during COVID and they appear to be a popular option going forward as well. And if we can jump to the next slide, I think either uh, Dr. Bachman or Sapari will be able to speak to the value of telehealth in Kaiser. 
And I'm going to jump in with a question first. And uh, Keith, maybe you can uh, address this as you summarize. Um, back in uh, March of 2020, there really weren't options. You know, the medical offices were significantly closed for many different reasons, PPE and, and things like that. And what the option people had was, uh, was video visits. Now, uh, it looks like there's a, 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 a range of different options. Do you think that the reason that you continue to have significant number of video visits are because that's what's available versus uh, people are actively choosing between video visits versus face-to-face. -face. And do you have uh, member satisfaction studies that compare video visits with face-to-face? -face? Yeah, well, we have the latter, and it's, they're almost exactly the same okay. in terms of satisfaction. A number we do track closely is the percent of video visits that are followed by an office visit in the near future. And we just see that in primary care. There's not a perfect kind of uh, location of who gets a video visit and often enough in primary care someone has a discussion of one thing they're there for their knee pain but, oh by the way i have a changing mole which is probably going to need a visit in the office take a look at that or biopsy it and that's the kind of stuff that we're trying to get better at being efficient with trying to make sure that things that can be managed by video or phone or, or use that modality and avoid the rework in the waist um, or a cortisone injection for a arthritic joint. If that ends up being the tree implant, someone's got to come in and, and see me uh, and for that. Pulled. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think it's really not, I think we're listening to our members as to what people want. And we did see at, that there was an interest in getting people back into the office at a higher percent than we had. So we did change our schedules to that. But I think if you just look at the longer view, there is an increased acceptance and desire uh, for telehealth in commercial population based on the convenience of it, based on that an office visit isn't needed for everything and more people are doing home monitoring for things like blood pressure. So ultimately, um, I think there is a trend in the future towards increasing use and desire for telehealth. Um, that's going to be a longer term trend that COVID was just sort of a blip and increase in it. It went back down. I think it's going to continue to go up in the future. Does that help? Does that make that sense? That's my question. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact that you have equal satisfaction and, and there's options for both that, that makes this uh, movement pretty real. I mean, we did. I mean, just in 2018 and 19, we did to a certain extent, to a small extent, reduce our, um, footprint of actual facilities and we took a few leased facilities as telehealth got bigger and we're able to sort of uh not spend the money on those and i think the plan was continue doing that i'm not sure that's realistic going forward since still the majority of care is being done at face to visits versus telehealth yeah bill um i have kind of a strange question that for both for both plan uh companies and i'm not quite sure how to ask it but Outside of your just standard correlations that you're doing, and this also includes the previous presentation of, of preventative care, have you noticed any correlation to plan choice on these metrics that you're segregating out? That's probably a bigger issue for Moda because there's a greater degree of options in terms of plan choice, but there is some in KP also interesting question that's not a that's not a, a strange one that actually is let's give them let's give them time to study that because they my guess is that they don't have that at their fingertips is that yeah or, or maybe i you just do. wondered if anybody observed anything yeah we currently not look at the data or at least i personally not looked at the data by that cut but i'm happy to to look at overall utilization by plan choice That'd be interesting. Is there a difference in in terms of like copays for a video visit? You don't have a copay. Is that true, Keith? That is correct. Okay. Except in high deductible plans, but okay. OM doesn't have one of those. Okay. So, uh, OM right. does have that plan three. Yeah. The high oh, thank you, Trey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Bill and will to study that. You, to to be clarifying on the point of my question, just so people understand. I'm trying to find some way of correlating a lot of this data from 
the last set of presentations and this set of presentations down to uh, income. You know, and so when families and employees have, have issues with family time and financial priorities, preventative medicine is an easy drop, you know, and it's not just about money. It's also about time away and scheduling and taking days off and stuff like that. So I know we can't get that data, but I'm trying to find other ways to try and tease out that data. And yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay. We'll, we'll explore that to a greater degree. We'll figure out how to, how to get at some of those issues. Uh, Robert, anything? Otherwise we'll move on to, um, to Moda. No, very informative. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Adam and Keith. Uh, on to um, um, Moda and telehealth utilization. It looks like you're you're still with us, Yael. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm here too. Bill is actually oh, here. That's yeah. right. Bill's on too. Hi, there was Bill. some question as to whether I was actually going to make it to this meeting today, so we made sure that Yale was prepared. Um, but I, I prepared these slides, and so since I was available, I wanted to make sure that I was able to describe them to you guys. So um, I think I know uh, pretty much everybody that I'm seeing there, but just in case. Uh, so I'm Bill Dwyer, Director of Analytics for Moda. And so we'll just jump right in. That This page just has my overall summary. These are some of the things that we've noticed in the data. And I'll just start right off and say that, um, so we, we've been doing these presentations every few months or so. The last one we did was about four months ago, and we didn't really notice anything um, that was significantly different between this time and last time. And because of that, I just put uh, the overall summary points up front, which are very similar to what we described before. I do have some of the charts um, in the in the presentation, which maybe we don't have to go into a ton of detail because a lot of it's the same. Um, I always try to put at least one new thing in there, and so I did do that this time as well. Um, but we'll go through just some of the points. So um, the second point there, so, so telehealth utilization did spike in mid-2020. It's been steadily declining. We've been observing that for a while, and, it, and we're still seeing that. Um, the behavioral health services um, largely delivered via telehealth. This seems like a more permanent change. So um, the telehealth, the behavioral health telehealth has declined like all the other services, but it is definitely way higher. Um, I imagine that that now that people have seen how convenient it is to deliver that service that way, that, that, that that's here to stay in terms of um, um, doing that via telehealth. Um, I actually wanted to make one additional point um, that is not on the slide, but just uh, in case anybody was wondering, so it's really awesome, like when we were just looking at the Kaiser slides, the way that they're able to break out some of those details between email and calls and so forth. And um, unfortunately, we, we can't do that because of the way that the nature of the way claims data comes to us. Um, there's many ways to build telehealth visits, and often we just get the office visit with a code that indicates telehealth. So we just, um, Unfortunately, our, our providers don't provide us with the detail on that, um, which is why we wouldn't have um, a, a way to show some of the some of the like email and video and calls and, and such. Um, but we do the best we can with the data that we do get. Um, anyway, uh, so I, I think last time I had presented some data by disparities on race and ethnicity, and I have some of that data in here. We're still not really seeing any significant um, differences that there's some there's small differences but those it's not able it's it's within the margin of error of the data that we have and then finally uh, uh, primary care utilization still lower than it was pre-pandemic um, the non-primary care has pretty much recovered it's very close to to pre-pandemic levels and then the, and then the last bullet point there is uh, the is the new one I have a chart on that just showing about telehealth with um, in, it certainly appears to be correlated with population density. So we'll go, we'll show you uh, the actual numbers on that one. So with that, let's let's go to the next slide. And this is the, the new slide that I just mentioned. So um, what, what you're looking at here is uh, the columns show each of the OEB regions. And in the rows, you have the different types of visits. And the numbers in there represent the percent of those visits that were delivered through telehealth. So you can see clearly in the Portland metro area, we had by far the largest utilization of telehealth. Um, so, for example, behavioral health services, about two thirds of them were delivered uh, via 
telehealth in 2022. And so um, pretty similar to uh, what, what Kaiser showed, although our Willamette Valley and Portland Metro, I think were reversed there. Um, but Willamette Valley uh, being a close second in terms of the adoption of telehealth. And it, as you look at these, you kind of see that, um, and what I meant by population density, uh, you, would, you would hope that in more rural areas where driving distances are farther, that there, there might be a way to increase access would be to increase telehealth. It actually turns out that it's sort of the opposite, which perhaps has something like Bill alluded to do with incomes, or um, just with general availability of infrastructure to do the telehealth visits. That's not entirely clear to us what's driving that, but it certainly seems clear that in the major metro areas, you're getting more telehealth utilization. Okay, I don't see any questions. Somebody stop me if, if, uh, if, you, if there are one, but otherwise we'll go to the next slide. And then this one is just again about the um, racial and ethnic groups. Um, I pretty much have divided it into white, non-white, and the and other the un unknown. Um, so there are um, the the numbers are as you can see pretty close. If you just go to the far right column where it says shows the percent of services delivered via telehealth and all the categories, you see that those are just very close together, and um, it would be. Uh, not not wise to try to draw a strong conclusion from those disparities since they're floating around. Um, for example, if you look at behavioral health, you see that white and BIPOC, you know, the white is slightly higher. But if you go down to PCP office visits, you see that the white is slightly lower. Um, and so they're just they're just they'll wobble around a little bit as the data comes in. Um, this is but, very encouraging. Yeah, from my perspective, that there that we're not seeing significant differences because it would suggest that uh, that the platforms that people are using, that the providers are using, are in general accessible to all populations. I, I'm sure there may be some small subsets, but uh, where there is uh, where we haven't documented that there aren't disparities but this is something that is <clears throat> very encouraging okay well let's go to the next slide and then here is a breakdown by ethnicity so where we have hispanic versus non-hispanic and then again another unknown and you see the similar thing uh, numbers are just extremely close um, together and uh, so there's just, you know, not, yeah, so in, encouraging data, not, not a lot of trends to point out, but that's, that's, you know, that's great news. And I think I have, so go to, let's go to the next slide. And this is the last slide, and just, just noting on here, a few things just about telehealth and what we'll be looking about in the future. So, so in terms of behavioral health, we have our Behavioral Health 360 program that is ramping up on 10-1, and we uh, hope and expect that that will have an impact, probably driving some more people to, to health, health, but in general having some more favorable impacts on behavioral health in general. Um, we are looking at opportunities for expanded data collection on race, ethnicity, and language. Um, right now, there are quite a few members for whom we don't have as much race and ethnicity and language data as we would like, um, and so, so, you know, a lot of that is just, you know, the data that we get from the OAB members um, is, is limited, but there's other ways that we can get outside data to supplement that, and we've been working on that. Uh, that's one of our MoDA company priorities. And then uh, finally, just use of health context data, health context meaning um, things like income, like Bill had mentioned, basically social determinants of health and other other things that would uh, factor into somebody's decisions to use healthcare services and how effective that is and, and what channel it might be delivered through. And so the more of that data that we can get, both through a Moto 360 and, and other places, um, we, we feel like this will that, that 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 will help in general, not only with telehealth but other things as well. But just wanted to mention that out there in the context of the telehealth discussion. And with that, any, I think that's all I have for you guys. Any 
questions or comments from um, CL members? So, so Bill, I have an explanation for the high metro um, telehealth. Uh, it's traffic, um, and uh, it, you know the and the other part is where people work isn't always where they live. So it's the additional issue of getting um, uh, getting from point A to point B during their workday that may be complicating uh, it and making it more attractive. I don't think it's technology, um, uh, you know, use of technology or something like that or availability of it. I think it's uh, complexity of living in the metro. You know, interesting side note to that is in my district, which is just literally across the river from the metro boundary, is we created a room a privacy room for our employees to use telehealth perfect in a in a safe space in the room so you didn't have to take time off from work yeah. and i know a lot of metro districts did that and i don't know about outside of metro but that is something that was requested by employees and and something we yeah. deliver on yeah yeah very interesting yeah we'll see how those trends change over time but uh but i think that um yeah the complexity of living in the metro um with traffic and and all is that's i think that may be part of it okay uh any if not anything else we get to continue on thank you very much bill um and we are uh, just in terms of a time check, we are a couple minutes early, which is great. Um, and uh, we're now switching over to uh, dental. And uh, this has been another uh, one of our COVID impact um, uh, studies. So uh, I would ask each of our um, dental uh, plans to talk about whether or not you think that we've hit kind of steady state now and um, and we can just move into dental service utilization on an on our usual rhythm. So first up I see is Kaiser Permanente, uh, Dan Pilstrom and Santo Graciano. Yes. Hey. Hi, everybody. Can Welcome. you hear me OK? Yep. Great. Um, I'll just introduce myself. My name's Dan Pilstrom. I'm a general dentist. I work at the Cedar Hills office, and I'm also director of evidence-based practice. Santo, I'm going to have you introduce yourself. Uh, he's new to us, uh, been with the dental program and the medical group for a long time now. Yeah, I'm Santo Graziano, uh, director of operations for our dental uh, program at Kaiser Permanente. Welcome. Uh, thanks for having me join you today. And we'll Welcome. just go through the slides. Um, can you go to the next one, please? So this is the story of the last three and a half years. Um, purple is 2022, green is 2021, orange is 2020, and 2019 is BC, before COVID. Um, and we see those trends, which we'll see reflected in the next several slides around how the utilization seems to be, Tom, in a bit of a steady state, but Gosh, there's so many things in flux still that we'll get to around staffing and changing patient perception around the need for dental services that it's hard to know when we've reached that steady state. But go ahead and go to the next slide. This is um, utilization per thousand of diagnostic, preventative, periodontal, and dental filling services. You know, to me, what I see is diagnostic and dental fillings. The utilization seems to be um, back to about 2019 levels. Um, where we see the big change is in preventive services. And I think the story here is the story of some patient hesitancy. Perhaps um, patients have a little bit more um, uh, comfort level with not coming to see us every six months and certainly for low risk healthy adults we don't encourage patients to see us every six months and I think um, that has uh, hit home for some but also the other big part of the story is staffing and um, 
recruiting and retaining the dental assistants that support all of the things like dental x-rays, sterilization, um, plus hygiene hygienists who actually you know do the preventative services and the dental cleanings. So I think we're still um, down staff where we'd like to be. Santo, do you have any insight into the dental operations? Yeah, I mean, for our dental assistance positions, that's an uh, area that I think across the nation we're struggling in filling those. Um, I know Kaiser Permanente, as well as Willamette, has done some creative things, partnering with PCC uh, to pay for students' tuition. Uh, that's something that we do at Kaiser. We add extra clinical uh, pieces through. So our first cohort, we graduated four from, uh, and we have 10 enrolled for this September. Um, it's something that we're seeing across a lot of different positions within healthcare is that less people are, are enrolling in the programs in school. So uh, we're really doing some grassroots work uh, with different groups um, to try to you know, help those who are unemployed or underemployed uh, <clears throat> without education um, to really get in uh, and help pay for this to help um, then fill fill the gap on these positions. Yeah. Are there questions at all from the group? If there are, just put your hand up in the chat and we'll get to them. I'm going to keep going though. Um, next slide, please. Uh, these are a different tier of services, endodontic, oral surgery, extractions, dental crowns and bridges, dentures and partial, partial, dent partial dentures and um, full dentures. Here we see uh, a, a much closer utilization to 2019, if that's our baseline. And these are services that you'd expect. You can't really um, put these services off because patients are coming in out of the urgency, out of pain, things like that. So these are things like root canals or tooth extractions. And then um, prosthetics um, that give people their smile back. Um, crown services. Uh, is pretty much back to or above 2021 levels and kind of right in between 2019 and 2020. So um, these services did uh, seem to come back to um, 2019 levels. And next slide. So we're going to get into utilization now per thousand by race and ethnicity. This is new information for us. I'm not uh, really haven't analyzed it all and still trying to wrap my head around what it all means. Um, so uh, we'll go through it. If 2019 again is our baseline data, we tend to see pretty even utilization, I think, um, at least pre-pandemic around um, utilization per thousand if we look at the, the large group. Um, you know, light blue is American Indian, Alaska Native, orange is Asian, gray is black or African American, yellow is Hispanic, Regular blue, I guess, is native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander. Green is unknown and navy blue is white. So we see a spread um, fairly even across all services, and we'll see some differences as we move through the slides. Let's go to our next one, which is on geography. So this is utilization per thousand by ge geography. You know, our program is the metro area um, and then the Willamette area, and then we have other because I think and, and Nick is on the call too, but I think other is people that have addresses outside of our service area. Um, maybe they're driving in from the coast, uh, but you know, we typically don't see a lot of variation here by geography because uh, our, our service um, footprint is really confined to the Willamette Valley, including Portland. Santo, do you have any ads to this at all? No ads to that, thank you. Um, next slide. So preventative services per thousand by race, ethnicity, we see some differences here. Um, but again, if we compare to 2019, you know, I just think there's an overall uh, uh, decrease in utilization. It's just hard to understand if there's something going on um, uh, with different race, ethnicity and their utilization. To me, that's it's, it's just hard to know. Um, if we go to the next slide, we will see some differences among adult preventative services. Actually, yeah, this is geography, child preventative services. Um, really no, um, not super interesting data here in terms of variation. Next slide. 
And this is where we see some utilization um, changes. Uh, and even in 2019, you can see um, utilization of preventative services among adults for Black or African American and Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander is quite a bit lower than the traditionally high um, utilization among Asians, Hispanic, Latino, and white. Um, so, and in 2022, you can see some of these disparities uh, with the utilization of preventative services for adults. And, you know, you know, compared to utilization overall, uh, which looked pretty similar, um, these types of the these types of services are patients that are adherent to their dental cleanings. They're coming in for preventative services, whereas the other um, services per thousand, which was the whole utilization, in also includes emergent services, um, urgent care services, things like that. So I think this is where we're seeing some differences in uh, utilization by rate ethnicity around comprehensive preventative services. Any questions or comment? Okay, well, let's go to the next slide. And this is adult preventive services uh, by geography. Again, um, not a lot of differences here, so we'll just move on to the next slide about what we're doing about all this. So health equity and Kaiser Permanente Dental. Um, I'm gonna take the first bullet, which is really on um, kind of what we're doing in the back office around um, services to support our diverse populations. So, you know, some of the things that we really do to welcome um, a diverse population is make sure that we have outstanding um, uh, interpretive services. Um, as a dentist at Cedar Hills, I can tell you it's it's phenomenal. Uh, we get uh, oftentimes in-person interpreters who are in my room with me. Um, and uh, if they're not in person, we'll have an um, interpretive service where they use an iPad. You can see the interpreter. I'm there, the patient's there. It's really rare in my experience in the dental world to have that level of interpretive services available to us as dentists, which is super important in welcoming diverse populations into our offices. Um, we also have um, really good and um, regular training on cultural competency for our care teams, as well as a patient advisory council that advises us on things like the um, appropriateness of materials that we're using for patient education and itself is a is a fairly diverse group of patients. So we're really proud of um, uh, our efforts to, um, you know, create a, an, an environment that reflects the diverse populations that we serve. Santo, do you want to go through some of the other initiatives? You betcha. And I think one of those two up there uh, in that first cluster is around our, you know, after visit summary and oral health risk assessments. And, you know, one of the things is it's not just oral health, it's total health. So some of those contributions to it, such as diabetes, heart disease, how they contribute to different aspects of your oral health, all of our dentist and care team take that into consideration and help with coordinating that care with specialist or primary care. Um, and that also goes into when we talk health equity, because some of our populations have more um, prevalence of those sort of diseases, and it really helps to focus. Uh, you know, some of those patients only touched the dentist that year. They may not have intended on seeing their primary care doc or others, and that's an opportunity for us to help address and close some of those care gaps. Um, and then kind of dive in uh, where our future program's going. So we're starting up a Black Center of Excellence on our East Interstate building uh, on the Interstate campus based on percent of our population served there. Um, it's similar if, if you've heard about our Salud and Espanol modules, we have seven of those within primary care medical. Uh, so this is gonna be an extension within medical, but dental plans to be uh, uh, in that center uh, by Q4 of 2023. And so we're in those initial phases of really developing that plan and how dental will get integrated into that uh, to help with any disparities in care. Um, and we already do that with the uh, Latino population and really that focus on diabetes and others. Our social determinants of health, um, 
we've been screening at uh, a few of our offices uh, where we had LPNs. They were assisting with that screening, making sure did they have any financial hardships, food insecurities, housing instabilities, transportation issues, um, things that might get in the way as well to them receiving care. And, you know, I'm excited to say uh, on here, we're saying Q4 was our plan to have all dental offices we actually launched today. Um, so effective today, any qualifying dental patient will actually get screened um, and, you know, they can or cannot participate in that. It's, it's their choice with this initial implementation that we have, um, but that'll help us uh, with breaking down some, any of those care gaps, help connect them uh, to resources uh, for any of those needs that they have. And then already we're doing a financial assistance of 2000 per year uh, for members whose gross household income is no greater than 300% of poverty uh, guidelines. And that's something that they can apply for, um, but the fee and benefits uh, person at the office can assist them with paperwork and help through that process. Um, one of the exciting, when we talk total health, uh, so last year we did 5,000 flu vaccines in our dental clinics. Uh, our dentist assisted with 1,600 COVID uh, vaccines, and we addressed 70,000 care gaps uh, at, at our dental offices. 8,700 diabetic members had care gaps closed uh, who had come in to visit our dental office. So exciting opportunity that we have to really address total health while they're in. Great. <laughs> Oh, let's go to the next slide. We're almost done. Um, the next slide just goes over. I thought it'd be interesting to look at the race ethnicity of our dentists and um, that Permanente is listed in light blue and orange is dentists in Oregon. You know, if we're going to see diverse populations of patients, we need to make sure that our staff and our dentists reflect that diversity. Um, that's just key to making sure that our patients feel welcomed and our care is effective. Um, a lot of our dentists uh, are certified to um, as interpreters for medical interpretation as well, uh, language interpretation. So that's um, really key in our efforts to um, have a diverse workforce. Um, and our last slide, Santo, I think we've covered this before in previous, but we can go through it. Um, it's just all the things we are have been working on the last few few years around um, kp.org and the mobile app. Yeah, so uh, we call it a fast pass. Uh, so if you are wanting an earlier appointment, you're put essentially on a wait list that'll send a text and email notice, push notice that, hey, there's appointments available um, so that you have that option to schedule sooner if you want. We've innovated with kiosk and express check-in uh, and e-arrival. Um, at most uh, or at some of our dental offices and all of the co-located offices. So that allows you through the app to check in essentially uh, without any contact if you prefer or some variations within. Um, so really meeting uh, those needs uh, of however the patient wants that when they arrive. Uh, we have dental only access now on kp.org. Uh, so if the patient doesn't have medical insurance with Kaiser Permanente, they can still access their dental record uh, through the kp.org app. And uh, we've moved with online dental appointing through scheduling tickets. So that's a pushed ticket that gives you notice that you're due for an appointment. Click on the link and it'll present the options of what's available times for appointing. Um, so this has been rolled out through this year uh, and really uh, exciting patients who've received those have really enjoyed that option. And then virtual dentistry. Um, so it's a connect to dental care anytime, anywhere. So no co-pays for that. We've got 24 or seven uh, phone advice. We have dental direct advice as well as some dentists uh, on call for virtual care and definitely an option that we can look at expanding in the future uh, based on member needs. So. And I think that wraps it up for us. Uh, are there questions at all from the group? Yes. Hi, just a clarifying question uh, going back uh, to one of the first uh, slides. Is the reduced 22 utilization in any way linked to availability of appointments? 
You know, um, yes, I think it probably is to a certain extent. Although what we don't see is a lot of complaints and concerns around access. So it is interesting um, that we can't run the volume that we have in the past in some of the offices where we just don't have the support staff to su support like five dentists in a given day. We might have to reduce the schedule, but what we don't see, and I think part of what we did as a group during COVID is got really good at triaging patients. Um, we developed a whole um, wait list based on their urgency of their dental needs. So we're able to get in those patients that do have more urgent needs uh, within their time frame of, of, of needing to get in. Um, but again, it is a funny thing where you have lower utilization. Um, we don't have, um, but we don't see a large uh, problem with access from our members. Santo, do you have any ads to that? No, I, I think that uh, that's that's a good look at it is, you know, we are getting to the urgents and others through addressing it in triage, making sure we have available appointments for that. The area that might struggle is some of the routine um, and, you know, where that's dropped off. And then there's a little bit, too, of member preference. Some still aren't comfortable coming in. Um, and a harder one to address is the late cancellation piece. So, you know, if somebody does have COVID symptoms and it's present the day before, day of the appointment and some of the cancellations that have resulted because of the heightened awareness around that, so. Okay, anybody, uh, Bill, anything? Otherwise we'll move on uh, to uh, Delta Dental and Dr. Barrichello. Good morning, everybody. Good. Thank you, Rose, for advancing the slide. Um, I think I've introduced myself before, but just really quickly, I'm Terry Barrichello. I'm the Vice President and Chief Dental Officer for Delta Dental in Moda. Um, and we'll get right into the data, which will fall right in lockstep with everything that you've heard before in, in terms of uh, performance. So go ahead and move the slide forward. So with this slide, I really tried to condense um, condensed year over year performance. And so the bar graph shows each of the years, 2019, 2020, 21, and for the first six months of 2022. Um, and you can see um, it's, it's getting more consistent. So to the question of um, whether or not we should continue to do a quarterly, you know, COVID impact review, I, I would weigh in on the side that I don't think it's necessary any longer. We you know, our numbers are really getting pretty consistent. There are some slight variations, but I really think that um, I are going back to our annual cadence would be, I think, adequate at this time, but perfectly happy to continue to present if it's what the um, what, what CL would like. So then in the boxes on the right side, um, we just took out, we're looking at just the first six months of 2022 in comparison to 2019, and then broke it out by service category. So you can see generally hovering in that, you know, 85, 90%. Um, Perio is the one um, specialty that continues to perform really, really well at 100%. It recovered pretty quickly. It's interesting also that for endodontics and oral surgery, which early on in say 2020, 2021, they were in the high 90% of performance over 2019. And they're kind of coming back to a normalization with other service categories in the upper um, 80%. Um, I also found that the child cleanings performance for the first six months was interesting uh, because for 2021, it actually performed really well. It was ended at 95% of 2019. And I think if you um, think back to the data that Dr. Popovich presented that showed the OHA COVID case count, I really think that that um, early January, February surge of cases, I think um, that really plays into some of the numbers that we're seeing here particularly for the for the kiddos. Um, go ahead and move the slide forward. So the um, for the next several slides, we're going to be breaking out um, data. This is looking at unique visits by race, race and ethnicity, and then we'll do geography, and then we'll focus more on just the prevention. Um, 
So you can see that just in looking at 2019 to 2022 for all populations for, you know, breakout by race or ethnicity, you can see that the performance is lagging in comparison, which aligns with the with the graph that we just showed previously um, for um, just for in general to kind of set the stage for our population that we know for the data that we know of. Um, non Hispanics are about 82% of our membership. Um, Hispanic makes up about 8% and unknown is 10%. And then for race, 84% are in our population are white, 9% are unknown and 7% are BIPOC. Um, so then let's look, look just at the Hispanic um, gap, the visit gap versus non-Hispanic. So taking the unknown out of it and between and in 2019, um, Hispanics saw 8.5% fewer visits than non-Hispanics, and for 2022, it's 11% less. So that gap increased by a little bit. And then the, looking at the same thing for BIPOC versus white members, um, that gap in 2019 was 8.2%, and it's actually improved a little bit to 6.6% in 2022. Go ahead and move the slide. So now we're breaking it out by geography and uh, I'm going to go really quickly on the geography slides because it's very consistent in terms of the regions and the performance. So generally for each of the years 2019 through 22, the Willamette Valley, Bend and the metro area um, generally have a higher number of visits per thousand members. And then in looking at the out of state um, numbers, which almost for every category, um, look a little bit lower than than the other regions. We looked into that data a little bit closer and our assumption was that these were dependents living out of state and that ended up um, proving to be true. By far the majority of those members are under 30, um, which puts them in an age category that historically not anything related to COVID, that age category tends to be under utilizers of dental services. Um, they my assumption has always been that mom's not making the appointment for them anymore, so they're not as um, they're not seeking services as routinely. Go ahead and move the slide forward. So now we're going to look at just two slices of prevention, focusing on pre prevention. We'll look at child cleaning. So we're, this is 18 and under, and then in the next set we'll look at adult cleaning. So this is by race and an ethnicity. Um, and for and again for all categories, everything is a little bit under in comparing 19 to 22. Um, for um, looking at the gap difference in ethnicity, the gap for Hispanic versus non-Hispanic for seeking cleanings for kids, and in 2019 that gap was 8.1 percent, and that gap has grown to 13.5 percent in 2022. So that's something that. Um, we're really paying attention to. And then in looking at race, uh, the gap for BIPOC versus white was 9.2 in 2019, but that's actually improved to be 7.4%, but still, um, still there is a disparity there. Go ahead and move the slide. And this is the breakout by geography. Again, Central Oregon, Metro, Willamette Valley, can, um, they see the, uh, a higher rate of cleanings by children um, for each of the years. Go ahead and move the slide. And now we're looking at adult cleanings, race and ethnicity. Same story, um, 2022 still not quite meeting the, the 2019 baseline. And then looking at the gap for Hispanic versus non-Hispanic in 2019, there was a 19% difference and that has grown to 24% in 2022. And then looking at, at race, um, BIPOC versus white, that uh, disparity has remained fairly constant, but also higher than we would prefer to see at 19% in 2019 and 20% 20 in 2022. Go ahead and move the slide. Thank you. Um, and this is again the same story, Central Oregon, Metro Willamette Valley at a higher rate. Um, and then 
what stood out to me here is in looking at 2022, the coast and um, Southeast Oregon are really struggling to get back to 22 or 2019 levels. So um, I, I found that piece a little bit interesting. And then go ahead and move the side one more. And Erica, I believe you're going to speak to this. Um, Thanks, just a quick well. qu I had a quick oh, question please. for uh, Terry on the on the last slide. Do you think that the issue around the coast is just availability of clinicians, of dental I, providers? I don't have a good sense of this, um, Tom. I, I suspect that um, it's not necessarily the clinician, but as you've heard from you know Kaiser, the support staff, it's extraordinarily hard to find hygienists and assistants right now. And we, we know from our own dental clinics that we operate um, and we have many in the in rural areas that it's it is just a challenge to keep to keep um, retain and to recruit new staff members. So it's an assumption, though, I, I, I don't I can't say for certain. OK, thank you. All right, Erica, I'm sorry for interrupting you. No worries. Thank you. Um, and you'll notice that these recommendations look very similar to um, the recommendations we have on the medical side as well. And um, one of our biggest recommendations is just really exploring opportunities for better data collection on race, ethnicity, and preferred language. Um, as Dr. Barrichello was saying, we have um, data on a lot of our members, but we're missing about 10%. And then getting into the more um, detailed descriptions um, as required in the real D data reporting. Um, that's an effort that we're working on, and we are using our Moda 360 platform to try and collect that data better. Um, and then also increase collection and use of health context data from the Moda 360 model. And um, Bill also discussed this one as well. And we are using our Moda 360 platform to collect data such as social determinants of health data. And then we're using that data and um, putting that into our outreaches for members and using that to inform our outreaches. So that's an effort that we're focused on and we will continue to be focused on in order to better serve our members. Any other questions from the <clears throat> from the CIAO members? I, I had one about interpret interpreter services. Um, you know, the and it shows my you know, I'm having been raised and and worked in the medical area i'm very very familiar with what medical offices are need, need to do in regards to interpreter services and capacity um what happens in the in dental offices do you do you, your contracts require uh that they have interpreter services for non-english speaking uh patients Contracts do not require that, and it's not something that Delta Dental um, provides for our on the commercial side for our um, our network. We do that for Medicaid. We're required to do it for Medicaid. Um, it's something that we can we can take back and and discuss though. Yeah, I just can't imagine what uh, again non English speaking uh, patients. Uh, going to the dentist and trying to understand what what's going on in their mouth. Um, it may be part of the reason that, again, I'm making it up, but it may be one of the reasons that we see a significantly lower um, percentage of of services with Hispanic versus non-Hispanic. Particularly in the adult population, that that I yeah. I that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we need to, uh, yeah, we'll need to, and I just don't know what, um, uh, maybe we can ask our consultants to, to look into the issue of, of interpretive services in dental plans, you know, what, what the, um, again, it's hard to imagine not having that service when you're trying to communicate with a, you know, complex stuff that happens when you're with the dentist and, and not being able to use a language that they understand or that you understand of theirs. It's, it's, um, seems like a, seems like a, an, uh, a necessary component for healthcare. I'll, we take that as an opportunity. Super. Okay. Great, thank you. 
And I Thank do you. have just one more section, Tom. So if you yeah, great. No, mind. you still have time. No, you you still have um, in my calculations uh, a couple minutes. Terrific. Well, I'm I am super excited to um, introduce to you all an, an enhancement that we're offering. So it's in an effort to provide more transparency for our members, particularly in selecting a provider. So launching this fall um, on our Find Care tool will be a dentist quality rating tool. Um, it's called Dentaqual. It's it's through a vendor and it's based on an analysis of, of um, very robust dental claims data, not not just our own Delta Dental of Oregon data. Um, so something much more um, much more clinically oriented than say a Yelp review or Google Doc review. Um, and it, the scoring is based on a standard deviation from the norm with the assumption that the norm represents kind of the average level of quality in the dental community. And one of the, um, one of the features that I really appreciate about this tool is that the dental community is tightly defined. So it is based on a peer to peer comparison and your so general dentists are being compared to the performance of other general dentists and it's region specific. So it's by three digit zip code um, because we know across the US there are very significant variations in how uh, dentists practice. Um, so that regional specific, I think, makes it much more meaningful. Um, the data is run on a multi-payer uh, claims database. So it has current and historical claims data from over 70 national and regional payers, and that data is updated monthly. So the scoring on our website will be refreshed monthly. Um, and this uh, database contains, you know, utilization and claims data on nearly every dentist in the in the U.S. Go ahead and advance the slide. So Denaqual uses over 40 key performance measures across five categories. And then so each category score that is um, shown is a compilation of those measures. And then they roll up to an overall quality score. And the overall quality score is what we'll display on our website with a link to if the patient or the patient, the member is curious about what's driving or making up that score, they can click through to get more information. And the measures that are used for key performance measures um, they are sourced through a, a, a wide variety of professional sources like Dental Quality Alliance, HEDIS, Academy of um, Pediatric Dentistry, Academy of Periodontology. So um, very recognized and um, and you know, a lot of confidence in the types of measures that are that are being used to drive these categories. So you see before you the five categories are treatment outcomes, uh, commitment to best practices, cost effectiveness patient retention, and then treatment recommendations. Go ahead and move the slide forward. So this is just a mock-up again. We're, we're not yet live with this, but um, what you see before you is a, is a mobile and a web version of how we'll be displaying this on our website. So you can see kind of in the middle of the web version, you see the blue box and then the four stars. So the dental qual rating is, and it is actually something that they did quite a bit of research on in terms of how to present a consumer friendly rating. And the star system is very recognized um, by, by the public. So that's the rating system that they used. So you see for this particular dentist that it's a four star rating. You can, um, you would be able to click on this and then it would break out those categories to show, you know, per, treatment outcomes or cost effectiveness, how that dentist scored on each one. What you see before you is just the overall um, quality score. It is important to um, point out that not all dentists will right away have a rating, and there's uh, a couple reasons for that. Primarily is that Denaqual requires there to be um, a robust volume to support or in, and lend credibility to the scoring. So there needs to be at least 100 records for each of those measures um, and they need to have for the peer comparison, they need to have at least three dentists um, in that zip code in order to qualify for the scoring. 
And then also they do allow dentists to, and we, we will allow dentists to request to not have a score shown if they prefer that. However, in um, working with other Delta member companies who have already gone live with this, with um, a much larger dentist network um, participating with them, uh, they've literally had fewer than five dentists request that, and one actually came back and, and then reversed their request and asked for it to go ahead and be displayed. And my suspicion is I think there's just a little unease by dentists to be, you know, this idea of being rated. Um, but generally, this is what we know this is what consumers are asking for. They know that their patients are, you know, want this information. Um, so it's been uh, it's been accepted quite well by the profession. Um, and I think that concludes everything. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions or comments? Okay. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting uh, about the uh, dental qual and see how it plays out and how much it helps um, um, members choose where they go. Um, on to uh, Willamette Dental Group and Dr. Chamber. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be here with you. Um, I uh, it's great hearing the presentations from the other groups and and seeing the just the great things that they're doing to try to promote uh, better preventative care and better uh, outreach to patients. And uh, that's definitely a goal I think of all three of the carriers. Uh, on to our next slide. Um, We'll jump right into appointment utilization. Uh, appointment utilization is looking at just the number of uh, visits that the patients are having coming in, and it's not looking at it a ratio. Um, we have had a decrease in OEB uh, enrolled uh, patients uh, since 2019. Uh, so consequently, we would expect for those numbers to be a little bit lower. But what we do see is that we have had a real stabilization of that line from 2021 into 2022, um, with those numbers being virtually about the same. Uh, the one area where I can tell you I'm not thrilled about, and it's been a continual area of focus, is uh, you can see where it talks about no-shows. And uh, you can see in 2019, uh, we had 466 no-shows from OEB employees, and that has gone up every year. Uh, you see 2022, it looks optimistic because that number is smaller. Well, that's only factoring in through the end of June. So if we were to extrapolate that out through the end of the year, we're actually on target to hit about 14, uh, 1,450 uh, no-shows for the year. And just throw out an example, uh, in June, we had 252 no-shows. Uh, and cool. our past years, uh, we've been averaging about 100 no-shows. Uh, there's been some discussion from the other carriers that, you know, in part, it is that patients are more mindful of if they have cold or flu symptoms, uh, you know, we're asking them to stay home. You know, we don't want them in the offices for the safety of other patients and also for the safety of staff. Um, so we do have more uh, late cancellations from patients. Um, we've done several things as an organization to have additional outreach to patients, uh, reminder calls, reminder texts, uh, to try to minimize uh, the no-show rate. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, and we look at preventative services utilization. Uh, again, uh, we can see that we have had, you know, that number has been fairly stable from 2020 and 2021. Um, in fact, we're equal to all 20, 21 levels uh, and higher than obviously 2020 levels. Uh, but that continues to be a focus. Uh, we, as we've talked about before, we have built in uh, support systems, decision support systems, encouraging our providers to provide preventative services, sealants, fluoride varnishes, um, and necessary treatment. The, following slide uh, breaks the preventative services down in by region. And uh, it was interesting kind of diving into this data uh, this last month and, uh, you know, just seeing where, you know, maybe we have some trends or some areas of opportunity. And uh, what we found is that really all of the regions had an increase 
from annual increase from 2020 to 21 to 22, with the exception of two regions, and that uh, was the coast, uh, which several of the other providers or carriers talked about uh, being a challenge, and also the Willamette Valley, which Kaiser also uh, kind of showed that they had a little bit of a lower uh, preventative utilization in the Willamette Valley. Um, it's hard to explain 100% why uh, some of this is going on. I do think in part it's staffing. Uh, one thing that we have done as an organization is we've really upped our benefit package for all of our employees. Uh, we have increased pay across the board uh, for our clinical teams and non-clinical teams. Uh, and it's been effective. Uh, we actually, since July 1st, we've filled 32 positions. And uh, we're looking at that open uh, FTE or the open uh, positions have been diminishing and decreasing over time. So we're trending in the right direction. And with with filling more bodies and uh, more clinical providers, uh, our ability to take care, care of the patients and provide more care will increase as well. If we move back or move on to the next slide. We can look at preventative care uh, by ethnicity, and uh, we broke it down into uh, patients that report uh, ethnicity of being white versus patients that report ethnicity of any other non-white ethnicity. And uh, it was great to see that uh, our patients that were reporting ethnicity other than being white actually were receiving more preventative care uh, than our white-based population. Uh, you may look at the not reported and say, wow, the percentage is, or the preventative care for those patients is quite a bit lower. The not reported includes all patients that have not come into the office, uh, and consequently those numbers are a little bit lower. And you can see off to the side uh, the breakdown of current membership between white, other reported, and not reported. Uh, a couple things that we are doing as an organization, uh, similar to Kaiser, uh, we do have an interpretive service that uh, we can call into and right there in the clinic be able to have a, a translator over the phone. But our first priority is to try to get the interpreter to come into the office if they are available. In some of our more remote locations, uh, having an in-person uh, translator is more difficult and that's where we rely on uh, the phone. Uh, translation. Uh, all of our providers uh, take uh, mandated uh, cultural sensitivity course. Uh, also under each uh, dentist uh, provider kind of summary online, uh, it lists what languages those dentists can speak. Uh, for example, in my office, I, I'm fluent in Albanian and my other dentist that works with me, uh, he, he's fluent Spanish speaking and uh, he gets to use his language a lot more than I do, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, we want to remove all barriers to care, and uh, and I feel like we've been, uh, the data would show that the preventative care uh, for non-white ethnicity or reported patients is, uh, is trending in the right direction. Our next slide, uh, we break that preventative care down by region. And uh, it is interesting that, you know, we talked about the coast being maybe a little bit lower for general uh, prevention, but actually in the coast, we actually have surpassed our 2019 levels for preventative care to our patients that report a non-white ethnicity. Um, we also found that that was true in the Southeast region, uh, also in the Northeast uh, and the Central regions. So, and uh, in some of those areas, those are areas where, you know, we have high, you know, some higher ethnic diversity, especially into uh, uh, Central and kind of the East, uh, Eastern Oregon. As we move on to our next slide, we looked at preventative services by age and gender. Um, and you can see right off the bat that the children, uh, and that's anybody under the age of 18, 
are receiving more preventative services than our adult population. And uh, rightfully so, we typically see, tend to see a little higher risk in children. And we really want to target our preventative care, especially to those that need it most, who are our children. Uh, at uh, gender, um, you can see between uh, male, female, and other reported that the males tend to be lower utilizers of preventative care. Um, and that's something that we see through actuarial data, through all of dentistry, and, uh, but something that we obviously would love to see improvement on. So on to the next slide. And actually, Tiffany was going to touch a little bit on kind of the value of the Willamette Dental Plan. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Chambers. So we were kind of just asked to provide super high level um, the value of the Willamette Dental Plan in comparison to an entity coming direct with us. So partnering with OEB to receive dental benefits for their employees. Um, so just super quick, um, stability of the renewal history. So throughout um, OEB's 12 plan years, our average renewal increase has been 0.9%. And that table on the right there, you'll see kind of the percent of rate change and then the, the actual rate change to the composite rate. Um, so not a lot of change for the rates. It has been very stable, which is a great advantage for all of our OEB entities. Um, the benefits within the OEB plan themselves are also very rich in comparison to maybe a direct plan. Um, so with OEB, all of our fillings and routine extractions are covered with that office copay, um, excuse me, office visit copay. Majority of our direct commercial groups, they have copays for those two line items. So a filling would be an additional copay on top of that office visit copay. And 99% of our new business that we're writing also includes copays on those benefits. OLIB also has some benefit enhancements that are not offered on a lot of our um, commercial plans. So being night, night guards and athletic mouth guards. I know the other dental carriers cover those as well, but that's not a benefit that Willamette usually has on our commercial population. Um, so night guards are included in that office visit copay and the athletic mouth guard at $100 copay. We are continuing to waive that office visit copay for new patients. So on that, on the next slide, we'll kind of give an update on where we are at with that. So the office visit copay waiver is just to remove that cost barrier if it is a barrier to care for some of our members for that first new patient visit with our Willamette Dental Dentist. So this we've been we started this kind of back in March 31st of 2021, um, and so to date. This is just updated data now through June of 2022. We've waived 826 copays in 2022. We are continuing this throughout the 2022-2023 plan year as well. And I think that kind of summarizes everything we have. Is there any questions that we can answer? Um, CL members, any uh, Bill or Robert, anything you wanted to add or ask? No, thanks. I have uh, two additional two questions. First, um, it was um, again. I'm pleased to hear that you have interpreter services. I don't know whether or not you are able to identify um, patients who are English speaking versus not English speaking, and whether or not you could could cut utilization, particularly for preventive services, by that um, category? Um, and if not, uh, I'm interested to see if you can cut it by Hispanic versus non-Hispanic. You don't have to answer that now, but it'd just be an interesting, uh, our, the focus that we're trying that OEB and Oregon Health Authority is doing is trying to look at the issues of health equity. And so this is, you know, uh, language is one of the very first ones that is uh, ways to look at. Uh, so if you could look at it from that perspective, it would be very interesting, particularly uh, um, being able to contrast where there's kind of requirement of being, or where there's interpreter capacity versus where there's not uh, interpreter capacity. So that's one one issue, and I'll let you kind of respond to that if you may. Then I have one more issue. I, I mean, I agree, Tom. It would be fascinating to see uh, what percent of our patients uh, are comfortable 
with English as a primary language versus those that it's their secondary language. And uh, we do not ha have that data available okay. to us currently in our okay. electronic health record. Okay. So the, then the next question is the, um, you know, Tiffany, you just talked about amazing consist, uh, uh, amazing um, rate increases, you know, cost over a decade. Um, what do you think is going to happen with our with the round of inflation that we um, are contending with as a nation and across? I mean, it, it sounds like your 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 costs are increasing more than zero point nine percent on an annual basis. Yeah, and I mean, it's kind of hard to say. I would say, though, with Willamette Dental kind of being an integrated model, we do have our procurement team and things for all of our all of our equipment and things that are used in the office. We do have pretty good contracts and negotiations kind of going on behind the scenes in that area. Um, I'm not sure if I have an answer, but I can get more information for you. Tom. Well, I mean, what your do you have a sense yet of what trend is going to be over the next? year. Yeah, I'll speak to that, Tom, a little bit. I, I think you look at the, uh, the largest cost to all dental clinics uh, across the board is employment costs, right? Paying for our staff or hygienists exactly. or dental assistants. Exactly. And yeah. unfortunately, we've seen, you know, those employment costs go up across the board in, in dentistry. I have several friends out of that are uh, graduated with me in dental school that are in private practice that have struggle to even find hygienists and then when they do find a hygienist it becomes a bidding war of who's willing to pay that hygienist the most to bring them into their clinic right and right. that drives up the cost for clinicians across the country yeah. and yeah. you know it'll be be interesting to see what happens with the economy in the next yeah. 18 yeah. months i think yeah uh, i it, it's something that i have huge worries about because i uh, uh, dentistry is a microcosm of of the um, of healthcare, um, what I'm hearing in regards to hospitals trying to staff nursing, you know, with nurses and the amounts that it's, it's just amazing. So uh, it's going to be a huge challenge for us. Yeah, and Tom, I think the dental trend that we used in OEB's um, renewal calculation was 5.9%, mm -hmm. um, and that's for our entire book of business. So, yeah, we okay. will see right. if that's helpful. Okay, let's hope it's under double digits. Okay, uh, we are, thank you very much. Uh, we are done for the first part of our meeting. I have it at uh, 11.02 and um, very instructive conversations. Uh, and I'm uh, that what I'm seeing is every you know we, this was our kind of COVID update. It looks like things have have stabilized to the point now where we can move our monitoring to the regular annual, um, utilization. So again, the we'll talk to our plans and and, and uh, OEB leadership about that. But I think that it's been a pretty consistent uh, recommendation from our plans for both medical and dental. And um, we'll we'll probably move now to just the usual annual uh, follow up on these issues. Uh, so uh, again, now it's I've yacked some more. So it's. Uh, 1203 we'll meet again at 1113 thank you all
Okay, I have it at 1113. Um, uh, has, uh, I see, uh, I've seen Robert there for a minute. Uh, Bill, I assume you're, you're back with us. Give me a thumbs up, Bill. So I, oh, there you are. Good. Thank you. All right. So uh, our next conversation is, is it's our uh, housekeeping for the year where we go over uh, the re review the CO charter, make sure it still makes sense, talk about a uh, roster for it. And um, we're going to be doing, we're going to be piloting some new things this year uh, because um, uh, OEB and PEB have oftentimes similar issues to see what type of collaboration we can do with the PEB board. Uh, we'll talk about that and then we'll finish up with the um, CL work plan and public comment. Uh, and I think Glenn is going to walk us through the uh, through the charter. Is that right, Glenn? Yes. Great, thank you. All right. So we need the next slide. All right. Yeah, this is um, <clears throat> pretty much the same charter that we've had, uh, you know, recently. Um, you know, as you can see, the background it lays out, you know, when CL was formed, and really, um, it's. Um, the initial ideas for creating CL. Uh, the work group roles haven't changed um, as we, we've been doing. CL's primary role uh, is to review uh, and select measurements, to uh, look at data and reports, such as we've done today. Uh, it also uh, goes into to review, evaluate, um, and then recommend uh, changes, uh, program changes and benefit design changes. Um, we've also talked, we talk about here um, the idea of that we'd work closely with the IWG in certain cases, or at least, um, you know, being have kind of the lines of authority about, you know, forwarding on to and coordinating with them. Uh, in, in regards to the guidelines, um, you know, it's pretty much as that all members are equal, uh, that there is to be that members are are encouraged to freely share their ideas and suggestions, and that all CI decisions are by general consensus. Um, any decisions made by CI um, are presented to the OA board in the form of recommendations and that CL will engage other organizations such as our carriers and uh, partners in, in certain cases to, to provide uh, information. In regards to the membership, um, you know, we currently have Tom, Tom Siltabo as our chair, and then we have Bill Groff, uh, Jeff Brown, and Robert Young. Um, in regards to staff and consultants, really the only change here is that now we have representatives from Mercer who are consultant representatives. And then when necessary, all of course, we will bring in people um, from our vendors and our carriers to provide information. I would just say, uh, I mean, is there any specific changes such as especially work group roles or responsibilities that folks had questions about or wanted to see added? I, I think we're a pretty functioning group. The um, th the conversation that we will have uh, or during the summer, as uh, the OEB leadership team has talked about doing collaboration with the PEB, with PEB, has been around. Well, there there will be times where we. CL would deal with issues that have implications to both OEB and PEB, uh, whether or not we should finalize 
membership of temp members and whether or not it should be equal numbers and things like that. And we realized that we were getting way out over our, the, the ends of the fronts of our skis or however it's described. I'm not exactly sure of the uh, analogy, but uh, basically uh, we, uh, CIO is a work group of the of OAB and we should make sure we understand what we're doing. This is what this is the what we've been doing for the last at least six years since I've been with the group. And the only thing that we've had to add, uh, at least under roles, has been around our coordination with the innovation work group, um, which again has made perfect sense. So I I don't see us making any particular changes, but uh, it's the time to um to at least articulate what our roles and and the way we operate is and and to see if any anybody recommends a change and uh, robert i'm not hearing anything from you bill i'm assuming no I'm not yeah so so then uh, we may want to open it up to uh our our plans and to ask, uh, and you don't have to respond right now, but um, if you had suggestions of what work, what would work better, I'd love to hear them. We have, um, we have some, you know, time to discuss it. So, you know, if the dental plans or the medical plans have recommendations of how CIO should operate, that's different than what the way we've been doing and what Glenn has articulated in this uh, uh, in this handout. I'd love to hear. Open forum. Now this is Bill. Yeah, Bill. You know, this isn't really a change. I just you know, so what I find myself over the last four years of participating here is I see lots of great stuff uh, coming in the medical technology field, especially in the world of imaging and and uh, preventative care. And I know we talk about what's available today and how to engage our members, but I sometimes wish we talked a little bit about, you know, upcoming changes and improvements in healthcare and how are we in gauging those technologies in our in our plans okay that's uh that is something that we can sure add to our work plan give us a uh give us a little bit of time uh glenn and myself oh, i'm not and, i'm yeah. just it's just my wondering you know when i see yeah. this cool stuff on the news and news things that are coming it's like man yeah. how do we engage in that well, right for you, our you, members yeah well and, we you, we hear the only the part that I when you were saying that we do look at what uh, is coming in regards to um, to pharmacy changes. The the good news is they oftentimes are revolutionary in terms of their impact on uh, oftentimes rare diseases. Uh, the downside is that they cost two million dollars a hit. So you know it's uh, it's um, it's the issue of of um, the technologies sometimes while they improve outcomes oftentimes also increase cost and that's been the that's the double edged sword. But we'll 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 talk about how to do that because I think that's a that would be it also be fun uh, to see to, you know to to look into that. Uh, but we can for sure work with our with our plan partners in regards to both medical and dental in that regard. Any other comments from the plans? I know we take up a lot of your time. Okay, well, you don't have to do it in this setting also. So if you want to send uh, me a note or Glenn a note, 
about this aspect of how to how to in uh, issues that you think that we're not getting to things that we're spending too much time on um, uh, and other areas that you think we should be pursuing i'd love to hear from you great thanks tom we will um absolutely um review as a team and let you know if there's Super. anything that we would suggest great thank you um, yeah, and, and I, it's part of the process, we always send the work plan to the plans ahead of time. So yeah. they do have that opportunity to add subjects and issues. So, but yeah, just send them, uh, just send the ideas to me and then we can, uh, you know, bring them together and take a look at them. Yeah, but th those are the, those are the it's. I'd like to see, I'd like comments on process also. Because uh, okay. it's both, it's both the, you know, what are we, what are we looking into, what are we studying, what are we thinking about, but also how are we doing it, and um, are there ways that you think that would improve it? That would be very helpful for me, at least. So if there are, um, so there's uh, uh, Rose. Can you switch it to this second page? Uh, okay, and um, I don't, I think it's just two pages, correct? For uh, um, the charter, yeah, yeah, okay. this. for the charter. So, um, what I would like, uh, um, basically asking our CL members, uh, do you agree with us uh, uh, forwarding uh, this as kind of approved by CL um, to the board just for their uh, acknowledgement? So uh, thumbs up, got it. Okay, Robert, I assume you're on board. I am. Great. Okay. So the second topic that we were uh, wanted to go through is the uh, issue of uh, to talk about is uh, PEB OEB back one to the OEB PEB um, uh, collaboration. And uh, Glenn, can you take us through this? Sure. Um, as you mentioned, Tom, over the summer, and actually this is an issue that, you know, um, Roy has kind of uh, bubbled up in, I would say, the last four or five years, is Peb and OEB have doing a lot, been doing a lot more work together. I uh, have uh, really had many cases where just the issues that have addressed uh, really have converged. Uh, and. It was really felt by the uh, leadership over the summer. We talked about, you know, how can we really test out or explore uh, areas where we can, you know, um, you know, share, use the purchasing power, PEB and OEB and its purchasing power together, uh, how we can um, work to leverage the data as well as ways we can kind of leverage the resources that are used for plan management, plan design in multiple number of areas. Uh, and then also to clarify the boundaries, lines of authority and relationships between CL and IWG. Because when the innovation work group was formed, um, you know, we really now with the innovation work group handling a lot of looking kind of at the more high level uh, projects and issues, uh, then how does, what is CL's role then with that? Um, and based on that, we came up with the, um, the idea or project where we do a pilot project over the next 12 months where CL will um, address uh, a select number of uh, issues that, that affect both PEB and OEB. Um, you probably around three to four and or make recommendate, you know, will report and make recommendations to the PEB and OEB boards based on it. Uh, we'll invite one to four uh, PEB members based on their time and um, availability, and as well as uh, the PEB Mercer team will be involved and PEB staff um, to participate in the meetings and really to join in the discussion. At the end of the year, CL will report the experience of addressing the issues and provide recommendations on possible next steps. 
This we felt would be the best way is really to conduct a pilot project on this and looking at, you know, if CO with them addressing some of these both PEB and OEB issues, uh, how did that work? What was its efficiency? What were the costs? And then looking at what could be the possible next steps on that. And Glenn, uh, if I could just add, uh, Tom, sure. you know that um, Seattle's been such a huge part of, of OEB success over the years, and I think the last thing that that we wanted to do when we initially talked about this is, you know, to disrupt that. And um, but at the same time, you know, um, part of what the Senate Bill 1067 bill that um, really um, impacted uh, PEB and OEB in 2017. Um, the intent behind it was, as Glenn said, to leverage, uh, maximize leveraging purchasing power and data administration and not to merge the boards, but um, but definitely to look for opportunities wherever they are to um, become more efficient. Um, and anytime we talk with the legislature, they always want to talk about um, ways that we be become more efficient and work together to achieve common goals. So so I think this is just our kind of a, the toe in the water and um, see how it goes and, and then go from there. Ali, do you think it's um, um, just to give CL members a more to chew on some ideas of what of where we would have, what type of conversations we would have. I mean, things that we've talked about are reviewing um, quality metrics of both of them, uh, you know, both OEB and PEBS uh, quality metrics together uh, and looking at innovation that's happening um, across both uh, OEB and PEB. Is, is, would you say that's an example of one? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of plan management kind of um, issues, uh, especially around pharmacy, um, how to deal with some new um, really expensive um, um, drugs that come onto the market um, collaboratively. And, um, you know, I think um, other things, uh, you know, the, the innovation work group, you know, is mostly um, focused on on long and short term strategy. Um, obviously, Seattle does as well, but um, um, maybe um, um, I think there's a lot of um, um, opportunities around uh, data and looking at joint data kinds of, especially as we bring up a new benefit management system and we start getting access to more real D kind of data um, that uh, we could really leverage like the conversation this morning. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point, Sully. And, and, and you know, I think the the idea was is that you know because of CIO's current role with OEB, where we look at uh, issues and items in more detail and then make recommendations to the board. It was it was felt well. Let's test that out for PEB because PEB does not have a current you know currently does not have a similar work group that they will forward you know items to to do a more detailed review it's all done through staff and uh the consultant directly to the board I, can i chime in here with a comment please please um i i'm gonna need something more basic before we go to the level you guys are discussing right now and you know i'll just be blunt you know somebody needs to talk to me about what is pep Yes. Who is the providers? Who who are the things? Who are the regional areas? Got How it. do state agencies offer the plans? Like our districts can choose. Are all state agencies involved in PEB? You know, I need I need to know what is PEB, right? I'm not a I'm not a state worker, so I don't know these things. And if I'm going to understand how to collaborate, I need to know what is PEB first. And you can do that in a Starbucks with me for two hours if I'm the only one, or or whatever. I'm good. Just I don't I don't know how to come chime in here because I don't even know what PEB is other than an agency sure. provider of insurance for state employees. Yeah. So state what you've just done is you've just validated our first topic that if you looked at if you look at the work plan uh, for October, it's called uh, OEB PEB 101. 
where we're going to go into exactly what you just asked for. And like I said, if I'm the only one, I can sit with somebody. No, 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 not the only one. You're not the. We have to. We and and the issues for for PEB membership. The, the they need to understand what OEB is. It, you know, because we are distinct. You know, the the idea that was the absurdity. I'm sorry, that was the challenge of merging the OEB and the PEB boards. Is that we really have distinctly different um, stakeholders. And the decision making processes around healthcare are different. We do overlap with um, our two medical providers uh, are part of are part of PEB, but they're but also the problem. Don't they have Providence as well? Yeah, which is their which is manages their self funded component, which is the majority yeah. of it. So so it is. It's complex and and we're we, we'll need to uh, see how we'll need to understand exactly what you just said, Bill. We we will need that and and we'll level set at our first uh, at our first meeting. Looking that, forward. That, that's that's how we start. That's how we'll start. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, just. Just add a couple of things. Um, I, I see some value in. Uh, jointly uh, figuring out what what measurements we're going to look at, because that's part of CL's job and also, you know, making sure we have some common viewpoints on how we're going to approach equity. Uh, but I also think that we need to think about how this would uh, integrate or and overlap with the IWG because we already have a group that already uh, works jointly with PEB as well. Right. right. It, agreed. Um, an example of of a joint um, uh, issue that that you would think that OEB and PEB should have the same policy on is the member concern that we had about wanting skin cancer screenings to be covered at no copay. Um, you know, that's uh, that that's an an element of policy that the board that someone is asking us to take on uh, the if we said yes and and oeb and peb said no that would make very little sense when the, you know you basically have public and you know a public um employee benefit package uh, so that's an, another small example of something that uh, that never would rise to the level of centers of excellence which is one of the major things that the innovation work group is dealing with or um so I, I agree that um it and that's the reason that as we talked about it robert we were looking at it as a pilot to see whether or not indeed we can find things where it makes sense for us to look at you know to jointly look at um uh, PEBS data and our data and our and processes uh, I, I think it um uh, I'm not sure. I think it was Ali who talked about pharmacy. Think about all the work that we did with site of care. Um, it would make sense if, if that is something that's made a, a difference for OEB in terms of our controlling our rates. PEB should be looking at that also. And there's no reason for us not to look at that concurrently. So I think that's the, that's what's behind this. And, and, um, uh, will uh, and when we talked about one to four PEB members, the fact that we don't vote, you know, <laughs> we basically see whether or not everybody agrees. And if everyone agrees, then that's great. So if we had four and they had and PEB had one representative on our group, from my viewpoint, it is all the same. The PEB representative would take back to his or her board 
the fact that yes, there was consensus or no, there wasn't consensus. And it, the boards are the ones that still have to make all of the decisions. Does that address what you're, what you're, I, I agree. We don't want to step on, uh, uh, on what the uh, information work group's doing. Yeah, it wasn't me criticizing. It was just looking at. No, no, it. I wasn't. Did, was didn't more. take it as any. Yeah, I didn't take it as as criticism either. It, it it will be trying to you know spend the year just kind of seeing whether or not there is opportunity or not. Exactly. Yeah. So um, this is the this is the update. We would also be bringing this to the board this afternoon just as an update and saying this is what we're this is what we're exploring and uh, bill to your point we absolutely need to level set i kind of see a little bit of talking to robert's point you know a little bit of difference in what my where my mind went over the word innovation for the iwg uh, which is looking at new new methods. You know, the first thing that popped into my mind is, you know, for me, I want to know for OET members, for the membership, you know, of the plans you had offered to you, what were the priorities that led you to choose the plan you, you selected? Mm -hmm. And I would like to know that for PEP members as well, you know, of the plans you had offered, even though I don't even know about them, mm -hmm. you know, what were your priorities that made you select that plan? You know, that's not innovation. It's it's understanding your constituents that you're serving, you know, where we're trying to work together to see how we best optimize that for for the for the collective, you know, kind of more along those lines. But that's just me, right? So. Yeah. Well, I, that's a good that's a good issue for Robert and Ali, Ali to take to the leadership group to to try to explore to figure out how to do that because I'm not sure we have clear mechanisms in a way we have the oregon two-step in that oeb comes up with with plans that we offer and then the uh entities have to choose the ones that they offer and then and, and that oftentimes involves union negotiations and then it's the individual member who chooses for himself herself or their family um so it's uh is, it, is that so, not the way pab operates no well, i'm totally yeah. in the dark then <laughs> well see no no see it's one and the one entity is the state of oregon and oh i figured uh, like, each agency and, and, operated and the, like we operate our districts they no <laughs> nope yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay I, yeah. i'm in for a big learning curve here here yeah. it's yeah, it's not as we're the complex one. They're at least this again. I'm going to learn something in this process, also, Bill. So uh, th that's the reason. The, but my understanding is that yes, there's uh, there's management and union representation on PEB, and they choose uh, plan options, and then. Uh, and that then uh, goes to and how much unions, uh, what what employees have to pay is negotiated, but those plans then go directly to to the employees. But yeah, again, lot, we'll learn more. Yeah, there's a lot of differences, but there's there's a lot of similarities too. I mean, it just depends on what we're talking about, but um, but yeah. It, I think it'll it'll come pretty quick, Bill. I mean, there's you know the differences uh, are you know we can put them in a side by side and and uh, you know talk through them and you know um, I think at the end of the day you'll find there's really a lot more similarities, um, uh, commonalities and opportunities that exist. So yeah, I think that a, a great example is our. Uh, our conversation around interpretive services for dental. Uh, my guess is, is that the exact same issue is present for yeah, it is. Yeah. healthcare and, technology too. Uh, what Bill had yeah. mentioned earlier would be a great yeah. joint topic to explore. Yeah, I mean, looking at joint purchasing initiatives, things like yeah. that. 
two bear claws and a large pot of coffee should cover it. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully next October we'll be together. <laughs> I'll bring I'll bring the bear claws. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, if if there is no dissent, we'll go ahead and advance this uh, this update to the board for today. Great. Um, all right, so the last uh, topic we have is the uh, work is the work plan. And uh, Glenn, do you want to? You don't need to talk about September because we've kind of finished that one off. But October is where we start. Yeah, um, October. Um, basically, and this is um, what I've done on the. Um, column right here is so I've indicated whether you know it'll be a PEB OEB and these are just ideas that we had chosen as possible areas where we could kind of do the uh, joint evaluation uh, but just uh, for October the main thing is going to be and Rose could you just go down to the uh, next um, yeah so the the main topic for October was to look at you know, for our medical and dental, um, but primarily our medical quality uh, performance measures. Uh, these are the clinical care quality performance measures. Uh, we'd look at performance 2019 through 2021, uh, comparison against benchmarks. Uh, the last two years have been report only due to COVID. So this will really just be looking at such as since most of them are HEDIS, the HEDIS benchmarks, and then any improvement strategies or activities. Uh, in this case, we've invited, we'd have our two carriers who do both PEB and OEB, uh, as well as we've invited Providence to do their uh, ones for, uh, for PEB. Now, just to understand, and we'll get into it next next month is we have the same uh, benchmarks uh, between PEB and OEB. They are, you know, they've done the same. This has been done to help standardize. Um, for the dental, uh, again, you know, there's only been five, but I don't want to get into that. But again, it'd be performance and an improvement uh, activities because really there are no benchmarks right now existing to the measures. Um, but uh, that would be one. This is an example of, and we used as, and we'd also have what you had talked about, Bill, is we're going to start off with a PEB OEB 101. You know, who do we cover? What is the structure? How does this in any way affect, um, uh, you know, how they deal with performance measures through their providers in many cases? But Mercer would do that, be about, probably about 15 minutes, but we can go longer. Uh, with more questions, just so that everyone has an idea uh, who's on CL and doesn't deal with PEB, you know, or what does, uh, you know, PEB do? And and the same for, we'll invite PEB members to, to attend. Uh, for PEB members, uh, you know, well, how is OWEB structured? So, yeah, yeah, so we'd start off with that kind of level setting, and then we'd get into the medical quality uh, performance measures and and you know uh into the dental too if, if we have time permitting really on that um for november um we wanted to we have mercer working on a or i'm sorry uh we'd have the moto 360 performance report um and then the peb oeb uh act report this is another example where you know we have the additional cost here PEB pretty much has the exact same additional cost here. Uh, it it's, doesn't vary very much. And we thought this would be a good way that instead of, you know, normally we do an annual report, we were going to look at doing um, more so to say, what should be the future of ACT? Uh, you know, looking at uh, what has been its effectiveness, what has been the cost impact, you know, does it have health equity issues to it or any other factors that should be factored into? And then see how we make a, a decision about based on the recommendations and scenarios that are provided, how do we want to proceed? And again, it could 
if we do for belt PEB and OEB on that. Remember, um, ACT stands for additional cost here. That's where certain procedures. Yeah. 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 yeah sorry. That's right. Yeah. Talking in acronyms. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, we had discussed about a policy for uh, using um, uh, no cost sharing for uh, individual healthcare services. This arise, uh, arose, excuse me, uh, out of, as Tom was talking about, we had a request from a member who wanted to have annual skin cancer uh, as no cost sharing on it, even though it's not currently legally required through what's called the, uh, the ACA, which has a whole list of preventive services that you have to cover with no cost share. Uh, then uh, we wanted to have, um, you know, Mercer come in and give us uh, really an example um, recommendations for a template for the PCP 360 uh, performance uh, or, or performance report template for the PCP 360 program. Uh, the other thing, too, is uh, we're trying to get uh, Uprise Health to come in and report on a pilot project they had been doing with Salem Kaiser School District. Uh, December, we'll have our wellness report uh, on our various wellness programs. Um, next slide. Uh, Rose, can you? Yeah, thank you. Uh, January, uh, we'll start getting our the recommendations from our carriers uh, for the medical plans as well as the dental and vision. These are plan design and benefit change recommendations that we get on an annual basis. This would be for the 2023-24 plan year. And then uh, we'd have the second round uh, for the to review the member benefit request or any others that we got uh, up till then. Uh, for February, we'd have the wellness programs, again, the recommendations for 23-24, um, and then the second round for the medical plans and then the dental vision uh, benef uh, benefit and plan design changes. Uh, March, we don't have anything scheduled at this time, but it's also, I like to leave that month open in case we have need more time on the benefit and plan design changes. Uh, next slide. Um, April would be the medical cost and utilization report. Uh, May would be the dental annual dental report. And I left in June, but this may be moved, uh, is to review, you know, the um, medical and dental performance measures for 23, 24 and select. So in this case, we could do, uh, because they're the same thing between PEB and OWIB, and this would just be the uh, clinical care quality performance measures. Uh, we you know, could use this as an opportunity to make recommendations to the boards uh, for these uh, for both PEB and OM. And again, September is, uh, you know, to be determined. Uh, one thing that I missed was, if you can go back to the December slide. Um, is that we'd have the pharmacy report. Uh, there our annual pharmacy report. So are, are there any questions? And, you know, also just to be, uh, just to remember that this uh, plan can change over time. We, you know, we sometimes move items, sometimes move uh, items do get changed or removed from the work plan uh, due to different factors. Uh, the good news is there's flexibility in here to be able to address issues that come up and um, uh, we'll go from there. But um, it always is good to have um, as much of a roadmap as you know, so we make sure that we have time to cover the things we absolutely need to cover. 
uh, and we'll try to work in, I think, Bill's suggestion around uh, upcoming technologies outside of the uh, pharmacy seems that they're uh, because of the approval process the fda we kind of know what's coming down the road uh, we'll talk with our plans about uh, other technologies that are going to be influential that we should uh, look at so uh I, any other questions or comments? Okay, no. I think we are. Uh, I think we are done. If there are no more, oh, public comment, Rose. Do we have any? There is no no public comment. Okay, thank you. All right, so I think public we are comment. done for. We are done for the morning, um, and um, thank you all very much.